The Venezuelan government presented new evidence on opposition lawmaker Juan Guaido's links to the illegal seizure of Venezuela's assets abroad by the US government. The European Union has strongly urged Israel to refrain from the annexation of any occupied Palestinian territory. Iran has condemned the latest US sanctions on Syria and pledged to expand trade with its regional ally. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south, and I'm Katrina Goss. And we begin in Venezuela, where this Thursday the government presented new evidence on opposition lawmaker Juan Guaido's links to the illegal seizure of Venezuela's assets abroad by the U.S. government. It is a criminal corporation that is aimed at undermining the interests of Venezuela, as we have demonstrated on previous occasions, to seize the financial assets of our country, to take over our companies abroad. Do not think that all of frozen assets abroad are in frozen accounts, oh no. Many of them have already been transferred to the accounts of the U.S. Federal Reserve, a vulgar plundering of Venezuela's resources. Brazilian police have arrested Fabricio Queiroz, a former advisor to President Jair Bolsonaro's eldest son, in connection with a corruption scandal. Police are probing the alleged misappropriation of salaries from Bolsonaro Jr.'s staff while he was a lawmaker in the Rio de Janeiro state legislature. Queiroz's arrest adds further pressure to the embattled government of Jair Bolsonaro. It also comes a day after the Supreme Court voted to move forward with an investigation into a fake news network that's ensnared some of the president's allies. A deputy of the lower house of the Chilean Congress, Camila Rojas Valderrama, has begun the process for an indictment against recently fired Minister of Health, Jaime Manjalic. We have decided to start the process to make a constitutional accusation against former Minister of Health, Jaime Manjalic. We are gathering all the records. We are searching the political support through conversations with the other parties of the opposition. We believe that there are enough evidence. The former minister was dismissed for not doing his job correctly because information was hidden and it made it impossible that he remained as minister. We believe that he must explain what he did and what he did not do. He has to be held responsible for the failure of the health strategy that the government has carried out until now, which resulted in high number of infections and many deaths that we, of course, lament. in Chile are denouncing that beginning this week, grassroots media will not be able to go out to report, not even in nearby towns, as a restriction on movement was imposed by authorities. While the measure aims at controlling the spread of the coronavirus, it would also have direct effects on freedom of expression. The repression against the people's media, which has been key during the social uprising, will no longer be necessary. They simply will not be able to go out and report anymore. Under the pretext of preventive measures to address the coronavirus pandemic, press freedom will be further hampered under Chile's new restrictions. And instructions from the Undersecretary of the Interior prohibits press workers from moving with their credentials alone. And now it requires a collective permit that can only be accessed by media which is incorporated as companies within the tax system. This leaves out a lot of small media outlets that are fundamental at this time especially in smaller towns where there is no other media that fill in that function. They have a key role as they are communitarian media, who now the local is reality. They cover the local issues, they run campaigns and report on things that would not be known if it wasn't for them, just as they do during the social unrest. We believe that this government is preparing the path for the next social unrest which is coming where it will aim to censor media even more, those who tell the truth, those who do not lie, those who are not paid by the system. 
It turns out that these same mainstream media are the ones that occupy material, material from the independent media. This is how it is during the social outburst, the riot. Independent media are the ones which did the reporting, which were later used by mainstream media because they were not actually on the ground. In fact, weeks passed the day before the official media reported on the aggressions of carabineros during the outburst, which left almost 450 people as victims of eye trauma. The coordinator of Chile's South Trauma Victims wants to send all solidarity to the independent and community media that nowadays the government wants to silence. We believe that they are fundamental to telling the truth about what is happening in this country. But so far, at least, they haven't been able to do that, even though the first 2020 report of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights was clear in demanding that the government provide the necessary warranties of free expression during the pandemic. Chile is restricting this access to small media, particularly digital, TV or print media. This has to be corrected because it is a threat to freedom of expression and inequality against the larger corporative media, the mainstream. We have demanded the government authorities to modify the criteria, which especially affects independent journalists, community and alternative media, which fulfill an invaluable and transcendent tax in the territories in the midst of this social, economic and health crisis. If this same trend continues, it could end up the popular communicators once again behind bars, and now for up to three years. Italo Retamal y Paola Dragnik, Telesur, Chile. All provinces in Cuba, except for Havana and Matanzas, this Thursday enter phase one of the lifting of COVID-19 restrictions. The Ministry of Public Health confirmed that 13 provinces and the special municipality of the Isle of Youth have not reported any new positive cases for the last 15 days. On Monday, Prime Minister Manuel Marrero Cruz stressed that the transition to the new stage will be a gradual process that will consider the unique circumstance of each province. Preventative measures remain in effect. Six Colombian soldiers were killed and eight others wounded during an operation against FARC dissidents. The Colombian army launched an attack against Alvaro Boyaco, the leader of a breakaway group of former Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia People's Army combatants, who denounced the Colombian government for continuing to breach the agreement of the 2016 peace deal. The army said the operation in the Central Meta Department is ongoing. Meanwhile, authorities say there are around 2,300 hundred such dissidents, while an estimated 13,000 former FARC combatants have laid down their arms as part of the peace accords. Panama's Civil Aviation Authority has announced it will extend the suspension of international flights by a month due to the coronavirus pandemic. International flights were first suspended in March as the spread of the virus prompted authorities to impose measures to better contain it. Panama has registered more than 450 COVID-19 deaths and over 22,000 confirmed infections. The country's Tocumen airport is a major hub for Panama-based Copa Airlines, which, like other carriers, has been forced to ground most of its planes. The Organization of Eastern Caribbean States held the opening ceremony of the 69th meeting of its authorities on Thursday. Member States of the OECS joined the virtual forum on Thursday under the incoming chairmanship of Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Dominica, Roosevelt Skerritt. The virtual meeting discussed COVID-19 responses in health, education and agriculture, the reopening of economies, as well as other key operational matters in the region. First of all, uh, we meet today at a significant juncture in, our, in human history, at a time when the entire world community has been galvanized for a global pursuit of justice, respect, and fairness, even as it faces the uncertainty brought on by a once in a hundred years pandemic that has already changed the way we live and that will deeply scar the economic landscape for a very long time. The challenge is now ours to provide guidance and hope to our people. And we have more stories coming up after this very short break, so don't go away.
welcome back to From the South. The European Union strongly urged Israel to refrain from the annexation of any occupied Palestinian territory on Thursday. EU Foreign Policy Chief Joseph Borrell, speaking at the plenary session of the European Parliament, stressed that if the Israeli government decided to unilaterally annex any parts of the West Bank, it would be a serious violation of international law. The senior official noted that the majority of EU member states will only accept a negotiated two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Borrell also said he had recently informed the new Israeli ministers of foreign affairs and defence on the bloc's position during a phone call. The possible annexation of his, uh, by Israel of part of the occupied Palestinian territory. There, our position is clear, although, once again, uh, it's difficult to find unanimity, but there is a strong, very much a strong majority of countries that continue supporting a negotiated two-state solution based on international parameters and considering that the annexation any annexation would be against international law. Consequently, we strongly urge Israel to refrain from any unilateral decisions that could lead to this annexation of any part of occupied Palestinian territory. I had the opportunity of expressing this point of view in my phone calls to the new ministers of foreign affairs and defense of Israel. This would constitute, constitute a serious violation of international law. Jordan's King Abdullah has warned that Israel's plan to annex Palestinian territory will generate instability in the Middle East once it takes effect in July. In a video conference with U.S. members of Congress on Wednesday, Abdullah noted that any unilateral measure taken by Israel regarding occupied Palestinian territory would be unacceptable as it undermines the possibilities for peace. He stressed stability can only come from the creation of an independent, sovereign and viable Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. Jordan protecting refugees from COVID-19 is a priority. According to the UN Refugee Agency, the number of asylum seekers, internally displaced people and refugees worldwide shot up by nearly 9 million people in 2019, representing the biggest rise in its records. Out of the 79.5 million people forcibly displaced, 68% come from only five countries, Myanmar, Afghanistan, Syria, South Sudan and Venezuela, which proves the point that if crises and conflicts were resolved in these countries, most or big part of the forced displacement problem would be, would be finished, would be resolved. One region um, about which we are very worried is of course Latin America and South America in particular, where countries host uh, many uh, millions Venezuelans. They are particularly hit by COVID now. It's one of the epicenters, as WHO reminds us. So this is worrying. But uh, my final point on that is that besides the health impact, where we're very worried is, of course, the economic impact. Because most refugees and displaced people, most of the 79 million we've been talking about, live off live in the informal economy, live off uh, very fragile incomes, daily wages, daily jobs, and all of this disappears very quickly when countries go into lockdown, which is what is happening all over the world. And these people are very exposed to that type of vulnerability. Germany has put around 7,000 people in quarantine in the state of North Rhine-Westphalia after a new outbreak of the novel coronavirus hit the region. The outbreak is believed to have originated in a meat processing plant where 657 COVID-19 cases were identified and which has now been closed due to increasing concerns over workers' welfare. Schools in the area have also been shut. Meanwhile, the outbreak has triggered a renewed debate over the meat industry amid widespread calls for better wages and working conditions in the sector. The employees, the 600 who are now positive, were all negative three weeks ago. We've tested them all. This means that the virus has entered the company somewhere from the outside and has then spread because of our climate. We work at 5 to 12 degrees Celsius in a humid atmosphere, where aerosols are formed and the virus can then spread through the air, which led to this massive outbreak.
According to US President Donald Trump's former national security adviser John Bolton, Trump asked his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping to help him get re-elected. According to Bolton's upcoming memoirs, Trump asked for gestures such as Beijing's purchase of US soybeans and wheat, which would help him secure votes. Consulted on the claims, the spokesperson for the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Xiao Li Jian, stressed the Chinese principle of non-interference in internal affairs. In his book, Bolton claims that the president's foreign policy was determined by his ambition to secure a second term in office. He also claims that senior advisers belittled the Republican leader for his ignorance of basic geopolitical political facts. And the U.S. Supreme Court has blocked President Donald Trump's move to cancel the DACA program, which offers protection to 700,000 undocumented migrants brought to the country as children. The Trump government must now provide lower courts with a more robust justification for ending the program, putting it in limbo after, until after the November elections. DACA allows undocumented migrants brought to the U.S. as children to apply for temporary status that shields them from deportation and allows them to work, but does not provide a path to citizenship. And we're taking one last very short break now, so stay with us for more. Welcome back to From the South. Iran has condemned the latest U.S. sanctions on Syria, describing them as inhumane and pledging to expand trade with its regional ally. Foreign Ministry spokesman Abbas Musavi stressed that in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, the imposition of such inhumane sanctions will only aggravate the suffering of the Syrian people. He also assured that Tehran would continue its economic cooperation with the country despite the blockade. Washington imposed its toughest sanctions yet on Syrian President Bashar al-Assad on Wednesday. Meanwhile, Iran welcomed the two-day debate at the UN Human Rights Council this week on police brutality and racial discrimination in the United States. Iran's foreign ministry tweeted that systemic racism, police brutality and violence against peaceful protests represent just the tip of the iceberg. It's high time the world works for the US regime's human rights accountability at home and abroad. Twenty-one new COVID-19 cases were reported in the Chinese capital, Beijing, on Wednesday. The city has recorded 158 new cases after confirming the first on June 11th, all traced to the Shimvadi wholesale market. 350,000 people have been tested for COVID-19 in the capital. Officials say residents now require a negative result from a nucleic acid test to travel, visit attractions or return to work in industries that involve food processing. Firstly, I can clearly tell you that the outbreak in Beijing is under control. My point is based on our study. We analyzed the flare-up dates of the 21 new confirmed cases reported on Wednesday and found that most of them started to show symptoms a few days ago. Since there is a period of time between infection and flare-up, we concluded that basically all of them were infected before June 12th. Beijing responded in a timely manner. The city detected the epidemic, locked the source, and took measures at the earliest time after the outbreak, and managed to cut off further transmission and kept the outbreak within a minimum range. So we would like to commend Beijing for this prompt and fast detection, rapid response, and effective control of the epidemic, which is a remarkable contribution. Japan has lifted travel restrictions within the country and said it is in discussions to allow some travel from Vietnam, Thailand, Australia and New Zealand. Starting tomorrow, we will raise the socio-economic activity by another step. In detail, there will no longer be any prefectural travel restrictions, including for the capital region, Tokyo and surrounding prefectures, and Hokkaido. Concerts and other events may also be held with limited attendance and occupancy rates. In Somalia, military forces supported by soldiers from the African Union mission have expelled al-Shabaab militants from the city of Lugajelo in the center of the country.
The Islamist extremists abandoned the strategic military demarcation line following a strong offensive by regular troops and an armed detachment from Djibouti. The terrorist group controls large rural areas in these territories. Kazakhstan's former president, Nur Sultan Nasabayev, has tested positive for the coronavirus. The 79-year-old former president is in self-isolation and, according to his official website, continues to work remotely. Remotely. Nasser Bajiev served as Kazakhstan's president for close to three decades before handing power over to his successor, Kasim Jomat Tokayev, last year. He retains a number of powerful positions in the country, including the chairmanships of the National Security Council and the ruling party. He is also constitutionally honoured as the leader of the nation, a designation that provides him with unique policy making privileges. The latest round of talks between Sudan, Egypt and Ethiopia regarding the construction of a giant 4.6 billion hydroelectric dam in Ethiopia failed to reach a deal. The years-long dispute over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam on the Blue Nile sees Ethiopia's bid to become a major power exporter and pull millions out of poverty, up against Egypt's concern that the dam will affect its critical share of the river water if filled too quickly. Ethiopia would like to fill the dam in seven years, while Egypt has proposed a slower pace of 12 to 21 years. Meanwhile, Sudan's Minister of Irrigation, Yasser Abbas, stated in Khartoum that the three countries' irrigation leaders had agreed on 90% or 95% of the technical issues, but the dispute over legal points in the deal remains unresolved. Now we've come to the end of this news brief, but you can find these and many other stories on our website at tellysoenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Tellysoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss and thank you for watching.